Hey guys, what's up? This is David Patrick Harry with Church of the Eternal Logos, and today I want to talk to you guys about Philo of Alexandria and his notion of the Logos. Now, this is the sixth video in our video series in which we're trying to trace the development of Logos theology within Western civilization, and we began our journey with the weeping philosopher of Heraclitus and have methodically moved our way through the Greek philosophical tradition up to now Philo of Alexandria who's actually a contemporary with Jesus of Nazareth, so now we are entering into the Christian era. Of course, I will be making a video on the Neoplatonists, but Plotinus comes a little bit later in history. So today, we will be highlighting some of the influences of previous individuals in this series, such as Heraclitus, Plato, Aristotle, the Stoics, upon Philo, but then Philo's influence exerted upon Christianity, Christology, the Logos, and even the Trinity. So those are some of the things that you can expect in this video. However, before I dive into it, I would like to highlight the book I will be reading from, which is in the series of the Classics of Western Spirituality. And I highly recommend this book series. They have tons of books on various theologians, philosophers, mystics, and these books give great academics, kind of scholastic introductions to the individual that contextualizes them in history and the history of ideas, but then you can read them in their own words. That's what I like, and that's one of the reasons why I love this book series. But they usually cost somewhere between $18 and $40, so if I was a wealthier man, I'd have a lot more of them, but right now we're moving one book at a time. Um, and also in this video, it's going to be a little bit longer than some of the previous videos in this series, because as you can see, I have multiple passages marked where I want to read Philo in his own words describing Logos. So this, will, this video will be a little bit longer, and about half the video is going to be me reading. So that's what you can expect, and with that being said, let's just get into it. So Philo of Alexandria was born roughly around 20 BC and died roughly 50 AD, about a 70-year lifespan. However, upon closer inspection, you would notice that there is some scholastic contention in regards to his birth date, and that it, there's basically a 10-year window uh, in which he could have been born anywhere between 10, 10 BC to 20 BC. So, uh, that's what I found in my research, but generally if you just do a Google search, you're going to see 20 BC as the date of his birth. So he is an Alexandrian Jew. Philo is Jewish, and he was born to an aristocratic family, and he received a classical Greek education. This is going to profoundly shape Philo's worldview and his perception of things because he's arguably more Greek than he is Jewish. And I don't mean this in regards to an ethnic thing or his religion. What I mean is his Greek was much better than his Hebrew. And in fact, when he read the Old Testament, the Torah, he typically read it in the Greek. Uh, scholars who study Philo often remark how good his Greek was, how sophisticated it was, but also how well he knew the Greek classics and the Greek philosophical tradition. So he was born of an aristocratic family. Um, his main thrust as an adult in terms of his career is he wanted to kind of fuse, synthesize Plato and Moses into a new philosophical system. Because for Philo, as we will notice when we read him, Moses takes on this very unique position I don't know if it, you want to say a divine philosopher or theologian or a messenger of God or something of that sort, where Moses is a central figure for Philo, and he even believed Moses to be the teacher of Pythagoras and the origin of the entire Greek philosophical system. This is Philo's opinion. And so from that perception, you can see how he views what he's doing as a sort of reunification 
of these two systems, the Hebrew, uh, Hebrew Jewish Torah based tradition, and then the Greek based philosophical tradition and how he's bringing them back together, if you will. Um, he, his ethics are basically Aristotelian and Stoic. And what I mean by that is Philo was very interested in virtue without passions. So in the Stoicism video previously made in this series, I discussed how virtue is the only good. Virtue is what the philosopher, what the moral person is always attaining to. Virtue within Stoicism is how you come into harmony with nature. Nature is under the dominion of the Logos, and therefore it is through virtues in which we can become in harmony with the Logos. Um, you're going to see a lot of Stoic influence in Philo, specifically in regards to virtue, whenever we hear virtue uh, in his writings, or harmony. He's going to express the idea of harmony, articulate harmony over and over again. And this derives from Stoicism and this idea of virtue allowing us to be in harmony with nature. And again, like Stoicism for Philo, to be in harmony with the Logos. Because for Philo, it is the Logos in which creation must pass through to attain its form, its pattern, its archetypes. Um, nature is under the dominion, is created through the Logos. So we're, we're already seeing a very stoic notion of nature in Philo. Um, he represents essentially the apex of the Jewish Hellenistic syncretism. And this is exactly what he was trying to do, is syncretize these two realms of thought. Um, Philo, one of the things that he's really known for is his exegetical and hermeneutical technique of allegory. So he perceived, even though he perceived all these biblical narratives to have allegorical significance, now, this comes straight from the Greek allegorical tradition, uh, and it's another reason why his fellow Jews did not receive him very well. So it, it's, it's well known that uh, Philo was not well received by his fellow Jews after his death, and in fact, he was more or he was better received by Christianity, which was composed of mostly Jews and Greeks. So you can see why he would kind of had an audience there that honored a lot of his works, whereas in uh, by fellow Jews, um, they basically reject his work because it's so Greek-based. I mean, Philo has a sort of cyclical understanding of history. Um, it seems, though, that he rejects the Kratio ex nihilo, the creation out of nothing. Um, he has a creation narrative that's much closer to Plato's Timaeus than the biblical understanding of God creating uh, the world out of nothing. And he also has a bit of an Aristotelian type eternal understanding of matter in the universe, which is confusing because being a middle Platonist like he is, He's trying to highlight a transcendent deity that's outside space-time. That, of course, is the Jewish uh, deity of the Old Testament, the Father, as he describes it. So, uh, given his middle Platonic, because he's not totally uh, Platonic, and having a sort of monistic understanding of God, and God kind of being infused with eternal matter, as uh, Plato, or eternal the eternal universe or something of that sort, as you kind of see in Plato and Aristotle. Um, so <clears throat> he, uh, he had ideas that certainly were contrary to the Jewish understanding of the world, ontology, uh, cosmology, creation, all this stuff. And that's why I mean he's, he's more Greek than he is Hebrew. In fact, like I said, he, when he reads the Bible, he reads it in the Greek. Uh, as an adult, he eventually learns Hebrew, uh, and maybe he learned it before, but from my research, his Hebrew was never very good, and it wasn't until he was an adult until he took a real effort 
to uh, you know better understand the Hebrew. But uh, even that, he believed that everything in the Torah, uh, the Pentateuch, was of divine origin. And this included the letters and the accents. Now, once you understand that he was an immense fan of Pythagoras and Plato, I mean, Philo refers to Plato as the holy Plato. And it's Clement of Alexandria, an early church father, who actually refers to Philo as the Pythagorean. And one of the things that Philo loved about Pythagoras was numerology. Now, given his sort of allegorical emphasis, the symbolic interpretation, even though he may understand the story literally, he doesn't believe the meaning of it is necessarily literal. So he has a sort of, um, I mean, it's allegorical, but to put it in different words, it's almost like the allegorical underlying of meaning, the symbolic importance of meaning trumps the literality. And because the allegorical meaning is true, that's why the literality or the literal interpretation actually happened. Um, it's sort of like a fractal understanding of history, if you will, uh, or meaning, a fractal understanding of meaning, and that meaning is kind of rooted within the allegorical, the symbolic. No wonder then that Philo loves Pythagoras in numerology. Also, he's dealing in Greek and Hebrew, and gematria, the use of numbers with letters and words and all this stuff, very, very prominent within those two languages. And within Hebrew, you know, this goes back to uh, the ancient text, and then is it even developed within Kabbalah? So some of you guys are going to be familiar with Kabbalah, and it's big into gematria and the use of numbers and uh, language and words and letters and all this stuff. So um, that's his understanding of Pythagoras. Like I said, Moses is the teacher of Pythagoras in Philo's worldview, okay? And one of the things about Pythagoras that Philo picks up on is the significance for Philo, the significance of the numbers 6, 7, and 10. Those three numbers are really highlighted in his work. Um, The way in which he describes the logos, I've written a few Greek words down. He describes it as, Hieros Logos, uh, Theos Logos, Orthos Logos. This is holy word, godly word, righteous word. And he he believes the Old Testament, the, the Torah, to be the word of God, the Logos. Okay. And for Philo, the Logos takes on a sort of intermediary role. And this, I mean this in multiple ways. One is it's not created and it's not uncreated. So for Philo, only God is uncreated, and the Logos is begotten of God. In fact, he refers to the Logos as the Son of God, the first image of God, the shadow of God, but uh, it's not created and it's not uncreated. It's this real ambiguous uh, intermediary state, but also... The Logos is the intermediary between God and humanity. The Logos is the intermediary between God and creation. And these are going to be consistent. Of course, they're going to be framed differently, but they're consistent with Christian theology and in our understanding of the Logos and how God spoke the world into an existence and all these, all these things, patterns, archetypes, mathematics, numbers, um, and so on. Now, one of the important events in Philo's life uh, that is often highlighted is what occurred in 40 AD, and that is his trip to the Roman emperor, at that time Caligula. Now, Caligula is a crazy emperor, arguably the second craziest only after Nero, but uh, Philo is chosen to be the emissary of the Jewish Alexandrian Egyptian community which, according to my research, was over a million people, which is quite a bit in the ancient times. So there was a million Jews in Alexandria at the time that that Philo was representing when he went to the Roman emperor. 
Now, despite Caligula already being out of his mind at this point, when Philo returns from his visit, he has very positive words to describe Caligula. Now, from my research, that was because Philo had a sort of political agenda for the Jewish people in Alexandria, and that's why he didn't want to offend arguably the most powerful man in the world, the Roman emperor. But this event was is very prominent, and if you look up any biography or anything about Philo, it will usually make a reference to his trip to Rome to meet Caligula. Now, rehashing what I've already said, Pythagoras, very influential in regards to numerology on Philo. Uh, Plato's Timaeus and his creation account, very influential in regards to Philo's understanding of creation. And Aristotle's categories, very influential upon Philo. Philo was uh, liked tremendously. Aristotle's sort of what we would call a scientific approach, uh, his categories and stuff like this. And of course, Stoicism. Now, Specifically in regards to Logos, Philo describes the Logos as binding all things together. Now, where have we heard that before? That comes straight from Heraclitus, and Logos being this organizing principle of the universe that unifies opposites. Uh, Heraclitus talks about this over and over, and Philo is also emphatic about this understanding that Logos uh, essentially all duality. Creation emerges through the logos, and logos unifies all things. It gives all things patterns, archetypes, this type of thing. Um, but the archetypes, the patterns, now that would be more platonic, and this is where Plato influences Philo in regards to the divine mind, the archetypes, the patterns, the development of noose, right? This is important in Eastern Christianity, this idea that we have a noose and that the noose, the divine mind, allows us to access the logos, allows us to access the realm of the forms, as Plato would argue. Um, <clears throat> this is also picked up by Philo, and he would agree with this, that the noose, our noose, allows us to participate with the logos, the realm of the forms. And for Philo... The logos is what uh, okay the logos is composed of the thoughts of God and that's why the logos is the divine mind okay so this is one of the things where he is differentiating himself from Plato he's picking up on the aspect of the divine mind the realm of forms but then he is inserting his Hebrew or Yahweh essentially Yahweh uh, as this transcendent figure outside space-time, and that his thoughts then compose what is inside the Logos. The Logos is composed of the thoughts of God. This is for Philo. Now, what else does he say about the Logos that can be traced back to individuals in our previous videos? That uh, this immense emphasis on reason, straight from Aristotle. Aristotle Remember, he had the three forms of rhetoric. He had logos, reason, logic-based, factual-based argumentation, pathos, emotional-based, and ethos, ethical, moral-based arguments. He claimed that logos-based arguments are the most efficient uh, because they're fact-based. But for Aristotle, we discussed how logos is very reason-oriented. He did, you know... He's not interested in these larger ideas of the forms. You know, we well, we discussed how Aristotle is inductive to deductive. He's interested in right here, right now, and then extrapolating into larger theories where Plato started from his theory of the of forms of the divine mind, the realm of forms, and then uh, was deductive from a priori principles, meaning that was a priori, and then he deduces from there. What else is important? Well, Logos as a mediator to the physical world. So I've already discussed Logos as a mediator between God and humanity. Well, the Logos as a mediator to the physical world, this is from Stoicism. So he's picking up this, this other role, you know, the idea of Logos being a mediator. This is very Stoic in origin. Um, 
he had immense influence upon you know the Christian apologists, Athena Goris, Theophilus, Justin Martyr, Tertullian, and Origen. Interestingly, I believe it's in Eusebius's church history, he actually describes a Christian monastic community that he attributes to Philo. And of course, now, once the ecumenical councils and everything get started, that that group is going to be group, you know, that, that community is going to be grouped into sort of Gnosticism. In fact, Philo himself has been described as representing a sort of Jewish Gnosticism. This is because he does have negative connotations regarding to the body and the body essentially limiting the divine mind, our noose, and that we are limited by physicality. Uh, This isn't exactly the Orthodox Christian understanding. The imperfection in the world is not that it is re restricting our divine mind, it's that we have fallen away from God and God's will. So the fall is how Orthodox Christianity would understand that, as opposed to some Gnostic understanding that matter is evil and all these things. So, uh, But Philo is characterized sometimes as representing Jewish Gnosticism. He also describes the Logos as synonymous with wisdom, or that wisdom flows from the Logos. This is actually one of the paragraphs that I will be reading to you, is him talking about how wisdom flows from the Logos. Now, wisdom in Greek is Sophia. Sophia is a feminine word. Logos is a masculine word. He's saying these things are basically one and the same. And he gets around the whole dichotomization and gender through the language by saying, again, using a kind of Heraclitus-like approach, you know, of course, the Logos unifies both, but saying that Sophia, wisdom in action, is actually masculine. And and so I will be hinting at this and highlighting this in some of the readings, but for him, Sophia is feminine in virtue. So for he talks about how virtue is feminine, but the actions of wisdom, action itself is masculine. Um, so, and well, just symbolically that makes sense, right? Action being masculine. But um, let's see if I have anything else here I wanted to get at. Uh, interestingly, he talks about the flaming sword symbolizing the logos. Uh, of course, from Heraclitus, we've already got, you know, what was the crux of the universe for him? The element well, it was fire. And we've seen this fire emerge over and over again, even in Stoicism. Well, now we have Philo talking about how the flaming sword, which is in Genesis, because the flaming sword represents um, Adam and Eve being kicked out of Eden. And I, you know, forgive me, I can't quote exactly where at in the Bible, but the resurrection of Christ, the crucifixion, is the removal of that flaming sword, allowing people to re-enter Eden. Uh, at a sort of symbolic metaphorical level in terms of we can return to heavenly paradise by way of the sacrifice of Christ, the Logos. Um, <clears throat> but also what's interesting, of course, you have the flaming symbolism, you have the sword symbolism. Um, and another thing that I think is interesting is is I've read about the symbolism of the sword also representing the tongue in the mouth and that uh, essentially the blade of the sword is like the tongue being stuck out. And then the, like if you're holding the handle, the part that kind of covers your fist is like the lips. And uh, I've, I've read that as a symbolic interpretation of the sword, uh, which would be interesting if he's saying that the flaming sword is the logos, because then that symbolically allows for a sort of linguistic interpretation of that symbol. So that's basically all I have to say about that. Now I'm going to get into God and Logos, and then we're going to get into a reading specifically. So God for Philo, God is transcendent without physicality, without human emotions, and through and totally outside space-time. 
So this is the influence of the middle Platonism that Philo represents. Middle Platonism was trying to create a more logically consistent understanding of God to a degree. And they do have a sort of transcendent deity. This is what we're seeing here in Philo as well. Now, God created and governed the world through mediators, Logos being the number one of these mediators. So you can understand God as a sort of uh, concentric circles, and that the very center circle is God, and that the first circle outside God is the Logos, because he does have a sort of emanationist understanding of I don't want to say of God, but it kind of is what I'm saying. <clears throat> he he has this large hierarchy of angels and claims that Christ, or not Christ, I'm sorry, claims that the Logos is the highest of these angels. Okay. Now, in the way he describes the Logos, the Logos is a demiurge. Okay, so he's getting that straight from Plato. And it is the image of God. Now, this is really interesting because he believes that we are made in the image of God, right? This is what Genesis says. So for Philo, he actually argues that the image of God is not God himself. It is the Logos, and that you and I, we are made in the image of the Logos, not of God, the transcendent Father outside space-time that has no human emotions and no physicality. It is the intermediary. It is the Logos in which we are made in the image of, because the Logos is the image of God. This is really interesting to me. Um, Of course, the Logos is immaterial. The Logos is God's shadow. So uh, one of the things that I think will be mentioned in in reading him is that the Logos is God's shadow and that the created world is almost the shadow of the Logos, okay? The Logos is the firstborn son. It is the begotten aspect of God. However, different from Christian theology, it is not created and it's not uncreated, where we argue that the Logos absolutely is uncreated. Um, It is the mind of the eternal. I've already hinted on that, sort of the divine mind principle, but that the composition of the Logos are the thoughts of the transcendent deity. It is imperishable. It cannot be, it cannot die. Like I said, it's, it is neither uncreated nor created. The contents are God's thoughts. Uh, and the analogy, I don't think that I highlighted this page, but the analogy he gives for the way in which um, God's thoughts are relate to the Logos is the way that an architect's design uh, before the construction of a city And so the design is basically the thoughts of God, and then the construction of the city is the logos. This is the analogy he gives. I don't necessarily think it's the best one, but you see what he's trying to hint at. Um, Since creation, the logos binds all things together. Well, like I said, that is a direct reference back to Heraclitus and the logos being the unifying principle of the universe. Logos is distinct from the material world, but pervades the world and supports it. So as I mentioned, the creative world moves through the Logos and therefore attains its patterns, archetypes, uh, you know, structure, form, all these things due to the Logos, which, as he says, supports it. And the Logos is an advocate for humanity. Well, we can see uh, see why that would be important in regards to Christian theology. And he's developing this all based on, you know, once we read him, he is grounding all this Greek philosophy within the Torah. And this is obviously why Christians are going to find it so appealing, because he's coming up with a theology of the Logos that matches the teachings of Christ, and you know, not directly, not directly, because um, he has a lot of aspects in his worldview that are totally counter to what we would consider the Orthodox Christian worldview or something like that. 
but uh, he is developing this idea from Old Testament scripture. So Christians, of course, love this because now they can just use Philo and point to all these verses, like being made in the image of God, like the Logos being the burning bush of Moses, and that Moses is communicating with the Logos. Philo's already hinting at this, which is the Christian understanding of the Old Testament, of course. Um, I should say, I guess, the ortho- Eastern Orthodox understanding uh, of the Old Testament, because I've talked to some more, you know, recently talked to some more evangelical Protestant types, and they aren't even aware too much of this whole Logos theology, or that the Logos is the communicative aspect of God that's being presented in the Old Testament, yada, yada, yada. Anyways, <clears throat> um, he does feel that way. And the Logos allows for human minds to be in correct order. So it is through the Logos, it is through reason, it is through logic that allows humanity to organize the mind in its ideal order to better perceive reality and therefore perceive the Logos and God's creation and all this stuff. And Philo identifies the angel of the Lord with the Logos. Now, this is really problematic for the Christians, and that's why uh, I found out, I wasn't aware of this, but in my research for this video, I found out that the book of Hebrews, the epistle to the Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, one, it's the most sophisticated form of Greek in the New Testament. So more so than any of the Gospels or Acts, or any of the other epistles, it's in the book of Hebrews that we find the most sophisticated form of Greek. And in that form of Greek, we find phrases that are common to Philo. So that leads to many theologians and scholars to believe that the book of Hebrews was actually a Christian rebuttal to Philo's worldview. Because as I mentioned by... uh, in regards to Eusebius' church history, where he references a Christian monastic community uh, that is tied to Philo's worldview. Sorry about that. <clears throat> Quick malfunction. But <clears throat> in regards to there was a community that was already tied to Philo's worldview, the author of Hebrews, which is debated, we t- traditionally say that it was the Apostle Paul. Um, however, it is also believed that it could be um, Apollos, who was a very learned individual uh, within the community, became an early Christian follower, uh, convert. But it's believed that the book of Hebrews then, because of its sophistication, was actually rebutting the worldview of Philo. And that's why, if you open up Hebrews right now, you're going to see this immense emphasis on trying to talk about how Jesus isn't an angel, and, you, you know, at, at first, if you're just reading this, it wouldn't make much sense. But once you understand that Philo is arguing that the Logos is an angel of God, the highest angel of God, this, this sort of highest uh, level in this hierarchy as a mediary, um, which I've already mentioned, then it all makes sense. The, the book of Hebrews is trying to show how the Logos is not an angel, how the Logos is the person of Jesus of Nazareth who um, was crucified and all this stuff. And so I wasn't aware of that. I thought it was really interesting. And now it makes me want to dive into the book of Hebrews and kind of find out what type of esoteric things that are in there that I'm not aware of. But also I found out that the book of Colossians may also be uh, rebutting Philo to a degree, as well as John the Theologian, author of John's Gospel, and his prelogue, which is all about the Logos, uh, and that's, the prelogue is from verse 1 through 14, I believe. That's considered the, pr- the prelogue, uh, or prologue of, uh, um, of the Gospel of John. So, <clears throat> that is uh, really interesting stuff, because then that, ins- that, that demonstrates, basically, that Philo was popular among early Christians and that his worldview. Now, you know, of course, they're fighting all these heresies. They're fighting Philo's angelic heresy of the Logos. They're fighting, uh, you know, later they're fighting Arian Christologies, um, Nestorian stuff, all that. So 
any anyways, now let's move on to these readings. First thing I want to read to you before I get into this book is a summary from the internet of the internet encyclopedia of philosophy, the IEP. This is a great source online. Sometimes you can't trust Wikipedia, but I do recommend the IEP, Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy, for various topics, though obviously it's going to have an academic sort of progressive bend on things, but it uh, it's good. It's a really good resource. So on Philo's IEP page, I'm going to read a paragraph about the summary of Philo's concept of the logos. So... That's what I'm going to do now. So Philo's doctrine of the Logos is blurred by his mystical and religious vision, but his Logos is clearly the second individual in one God as a hypostatization of God's creative power, wisdom. The supreme being is God, and the next is wisdom, or the Logos of God. Logos has many names and multiple functions. Earthly wisdom is is but a copy of this celestial wisdom. It is represented in historical times by the tabernacle through which God sent an image of divine excellence as a representation and copy of wisdom. The divine logos never mixes with the things which are created and thus destined to perish, but it tends the one alone. This logos is apportioned into an infinite number of parts in humans, Thus, we impart the divine logos. As a result, we acquire some likeness to the Father and the Creator of all. The logos is the bond of the universe and mediator extended in nature. The Father eternally begat the logos and constituted it as an unbreakable bond of the universe that produces harmony. The logos mediating between God and the world is neither uncreated as God nor created as men. So in Philo's view, the Father is the supreme being, and the Logos, as his chief messenger, stands between creator and creature. The Logos is an ambassador and suppliant, neither unbegotten nor begotten, as are sensible things. Wisdom, the daughter of God, is in reality masculine because powers have truly masculine descriptions, whereas virtues are feminine. That which is in the second place after the masculine creator was called feminine, according to Philo, but her priority is masculine. So the wisdom of God is both masculine and feminine. So uh, the wisdom of God, the logos of God, is both masculine and feminine. So in a, when I did the Heraclitus video, I mentioned how the word bio means life, can also mean bow and arrow, or bow, and symbolizes death and life. So it, it, it's funny how we're kind of seeing a similar pattern that the logos is both male and female, this unification of opposites. Wisdom flows from the divine logos. The logos is the cupbearer of God. He pours himself into happy souls. The immortal part of the soul comes from the divine breath of the father slash ruler as a part of his logos. All right. So let's get into this book. Now, I am going to read parts of the introduction, which are not obviously the words of Philo. Um, I am this, the, what I'm reading right now, it is a paragraph, uh, written by Philo. <clears throat> and it says this, and this kind of hints at the allegorical approach that I mentioned concerning the mind as Adam and the senses as Eve. So you'll be able to see this in this reading. <clears throat> and this is Philo. For there was a time in Gar Pote Kronos, Greek, when mind neither had sense perception nor held converse with it. It was but half the perfect soul, lacking the power whereby it is the nature of bodies to be perceived, a mere unhappy section bereft of its mate without the support of the sense perceiving organs. God, then, Wishing to provide the mind with perception of material as well as immaterial things, 
thought to complete the soul by weaving into the part first made the other section, which he called by the general name of woman and the proper name of Eve, thus symbolizing sense. So that's his kind of description on... uh, on uh, male and or, you know the development of the soul and mind and senses and stuff like that. Um, let's see here. What is the next part? Okay, this is the author of the introduction speaking. This is not Philo, but I still think it's important. In Philo's hierarchical construction of reality, the essence of God, though utterly concealed in its primary being, is nevertheless made manifest on two secondary levels. The intelligible universe of Logos, which is God's image, and the sensible universe, which in turn is an image of that Logos. Like I said, uh, Logos is the image of God, then creation the image of the Logos, Thus, though the essence of God, as it is in itself, remains forever undisclosed, so this is also a fundamental distinction between Christian Christian theology because we say it's uh, it's one essence with three persons in terms of the Trinitarian understanding of God. Philo is directly saying that the Father has the essence of God and the Logos is entirely indistinct, you know, is entirely distinct from it. And that the essence of God is is um, undisclosed. So this is one of the this is a central difference right now between Philo and, and Christian theology. Thus, the essence of God, as it is in itself, remains forever undisclosed. Its effects, images, or shadows, or to use the Platinian Neoplatonism term, traces, may be perceived. Philo further attempts to delineate the dynamics of the Logos' activity by defining and describing its two constitutive polar principles, goodness or the creative power, uh, poietike dunamis, and sovereignty, ecousia, or the regent power. Okay. All right, and here is another section. So I'll be reading a, uh, this is still part of the introduction, and I have one more section of the introduction I want to read before just reading Philo's words. And I'm going to read a paragraph from the author of the introduction and then a paragraph from Philo. So we now determine the exact nature of this unmediated intuitive vision in whose praise Philo's efforts are so unflagging. In Philo's philosophy, the Logos is the divine mind, the idea of ideas, the first begotten son of the uncreated father, eldest and chief of the angels, the man or shadow of God, or even the second God, the pattern of all creation and archetype of human reason. The Logos is God imminent, holding together and administering the entire chain of creation. And man's mind is but a tiny fragment of this all-pervading logos. And, and of course, that tiny mind is the noose. Always remember that noose, logos, these things go together. This is Philo's words. For how was it likely that the human mind, being so tiny, hemmed in by such puny masses as brain or heart, could be able to contain such an immense magnitude of sky and universe had it not been an inseparable portion of that divine and blessed soul. For nothing is served or or severed or detached from the divine, but only extended. When the mind, therefore, which has received its share in the perfection of the whole, noose, conceives of the universe, it stretches out as widely as the bounds of the whole, for its force is susceptible of attraction." I thought that was interesting that the mind, the noose, uh, allows us to conceptualize things that are infathomable, like the universe or the sky or something like that. I don't know. I just thought that was interesting. Now, what I'll be reading is the last section. This is called Philo's Significance. I wish the author paid more attention to his significance within Christianity, 
But what he wants to draw attention to is the overlap between Spinoza's uh, worldview, another Jew, um, Spinoza's worldview, and Philo's. So he is going to give consider considerable attention to that. But this is about a page and a half, and I'm going to read uh, the last portion of the introduction. Philo's significance. The preservation of the very extensive Philonic corpus by the church is due to the notion that the 4th century church historian Eusebius, that the monastic group described in Philo's The Contemplative Life, was Christian. Eusebius mentions a tradition to the effect that Philo met Peter on a journey to Rome during the reign of Claudius, and he regards him as teaching the doctrine of the Trinity. Now, this is highly debated, and most uh, scholars say this did not happen. Jerome even includes Philo in the list of church fathers. Had it been left to Jewish tradition, Philo's work would undoubtedly have perished. The Jewish Middle Ages had access to the had access at best only to partial translation of Philo's works in either Arabic or Syriac. And it was not until the 16th century that Philo was rediscovered by Azaria de Rossi. Philo, thus, had virtually no direct influence on the Jewish philosophical tradition. Yet Philo was the only Jewish philosopher who possessed an unmediated knowledge of the original Greek text, both literary and philosophical, and had elaborated a philosophy of Judaism that is radically transformed its inner structure. If my reading of Philo is correct, the, his worldview is in many respects astonishingly similar to that of Spinoza, despite the platonic chasm that divides them. Like Spinoza, Philo teaches a doctrine of eternal creation which places at the forefront of his proofs for God's existence a version of what appears to be the ontological argument. The human mind is for him a fragment of the divine mind. In Spinoza's terminology, a finite mode of the absolutely infinite intellect. And its highest knowledge is its direct knowledge of God. In Spinoza, sensia intuiva. God's nature is absolutely unchangeable. Spinoza would say that things could have been produced things could have been produced by God in no other manner and in no other order than that in which they have been produced. And the human will is ultimately determined by the divine. The authentic law is is rooted in nature or God. Deus sive natura. And man's highest goal is to attach himself completely to God, his mind absorbed in intellectual prayer, Spinoza's amor de intellectualis. The path leading to this goal entails the conversion of man's irrational emotions into rational ones, Spinoza's active and passive emotions, until he rises to a state of union with the divine logos, seized by a sober intoxication. Here, Philo's path converges completely with that of the God-intoxicated Spinoza. Still, while Spinoza's thought in the theological-political tractate is garbed in the rhetoric of confrontation and of confrontation, and his precisely formulated proposition in the Ethics are calculated to effect a clean break with traditional theism. Philo's philosophy is couched in the conciliatory idiom of Platonic mysticism and is further deliberately disguised to camouflage its more radical dimensions. Had Philo's writings been accessible to the Jewish philosophical tradition, they would undoubtedly have left an indelible mark on it, and his profound insights would have imprinted themselves deeply within the Jewish psyche. But the Palestinian Jewry contemporary with Philo was not much interested in philosophy, particularly when written in Greek, and the Alexandrian Jewish community was virtually annihilated after the revolt of Egyptian Jewry against Trajan. Philo's greatest contribution to Judaism was thus relegated to the fortunes of history, to the limbo of philosophy's untimely abortions, whose impact is primarily channeled through the subterranean underworld of intellectual history, whereas his significance for Christian spirituality proved to be of primary importance. 
So that was a mouthful, but uh, hopefully you found that interesting. Now let's get to Philo's words himself. Okay, so hopefully you guys can see this. His work basically just has a title and then a paragraph of what he's talking about. <clears throat> and I try to go through here and find all the ones that are explicitly talking about logos in one form or another. So <clears throat> here, uh, here, this one is called the divine logos. Though indivisible itself, it divides others. Okay. For the Logos is a lover of the alone and the solitary, never mixing with the crowd of things created and destined to perish, but accustomed to roaming the heights and taking thought to attend on one alone. The two natures then, that of the reasoning power within us and that of the divine Logos above us, Though indivisible, divide countless others. The divine logos separated and apportioned all that is in nature and our mind, whatever things material or immaterial, it mentally ascertains, it divides infinitely into an infinite number of parts and never ceases dividing. This is the result of their likeness to the Father and Creator of all. For the deity, though without mixture or blending and absolutely without parts, has become to the whole world the cause of mixture, blending division and multiplicity of parts. It naturally follows that these entities too that resemble God, the mind within us and the one above us, though without parts and indivisible, will be capable stoutly to divide and distinguish everything that is. This is the next section titled The Logos, Bond of the universe mediates between opposites. The Logos, extending himself from the center to the furthest bounds and from its extremities to the center again, runs nature unvanquished course, joining and binding fast all its parts. For the Father who begat him constituted him an unbreakable bond of the universe. It is therefore reasonable that all the earth will not be dissolved by all the water contained within its bosom like hollows, nor fire be quenched by air, nor, on the other hand, air be rekindled by fire. The divine Logos marshals himself between, like a vow amid consonants, that the universe may produce a harmony like that of literary art, for he mediates and moderates the threatenings of the opponents through conciliatory persuasion. So interesting that it is the logos that allows portions, order of, of nature. It allows, you know, water to stay water, fire to stay fire, all this stuff. This one is called the mediatory role of the logos, which is neither uncreated as God nor created as man. To his chief messenger and most venerable Logos, the Father who engendered the universe has granted the singular gift to stand between the separate, stand between and separate the creature from the Creator. This name, Logos, is both suppliant of ever anxiety ridden morality before the immortal and ambassador of the ruler to the subject. He glorifies in this gift and proudly describes it in these words. And I stood between the Lord and you, Deuteronomy 5.5. 5. This is uh, an example of Philo finding the Logos in the Old Testament. He's claiming Deuteronomy 5.5 5 is the Logos speaking. Neither unbegotten as God, nor begotten as you, but midway between the two extremes, serving as a pledge for both. To the Creator as assurance that the creature should never completely shake off the reins and rebel, choosing disorder rather than order, to the creature wanting, uh, warranting his hopefulness that the gracious God will never disregard his own work. For I am an ambassador of peace to creation from the God who has determined to put down wars, who is ever the guardian of peace." 
next section called Wisdom Flows in a Perpetual Stream from the Divine Logos. When the Israelites sought what it is that nourished the soul, for as Moses says, they knew not what it was, Exodus 16.15, they learned and discovered that it was the Word of God, the Divine Logos, from which all forms of instruction and wisdom flow in perpetual stream. This is the heavenly nourishment, and it is revealed in the sacred records on the part of the first cause when he says, Lo, it is I that am raising upon you bread out of the heaven, Exodus 16, 4. For in truth, God distills from on high the ethereal wisdom on minds, well endowed and fond of contemplation. Next section. The Logos, cupbearer of God, pours himself into happy souls. And into the happy soul, which holds out the truly holy chalice, its own reason, who is it that pours the sacred measures of true gladness to but the Logos, the cupbearer of God and toastmaster of the feast, who differs not from the drought he pours, but is himself the undiluted drink? the gaiety, the seasoning, the effusion, the cheer, and, to make poetic expression our own, the ambrosian drug of joy and gladness. So that one is really interesting for me because he sounds like Philo describing a sort of Eucharistic understanding of the Logos and that the Logos, he says, is himself the undiluted drink. Hmm. Interesting stuff there. So we're moving on, and we are now <clears throat> we are now to a paragraph that says, "The intelligible world is the divine logos in the act of creation. If one should wish to express it more baldly, he would say that the intelligible world is nothing else than the divine logos already in the act of building the cosmos. For the intelligible city is nothing else than the reasoning of the architect, already intent on founding the city. So this is the analogy of uh, the contents of the logos to the architect design in the city. Uh, It must have been somewhere else, but that's what he's referencing. He's already already mentioned this. This is Moses' teaching, not mine. For in the description of man's creation in the sequel, he explicitly acknowledges that he was molded after the image of God, Genesis 1.27. Now, if the part is an image of an image and the whole form, this entire sensible world, since it is greater than the human image, is a copy of the divine image. It is clear that the archetypal seal, which we declare to be the intelligible world, would be the very logos of God. All right. Next one is the logos used as an instrument in creating the world. Bezalel means then in the shadow of God, but God's shadow is his logos, which he used as an instrument and thus created the world. This shadow and representation, as it were, is in turn the archetype of other things. For just as God is the pattern of the image, which was just named shadow, so does the image become the pattern of others, as Moses made clear at the beginning of the law code by saying, and God made man after the image of God, Genesis 127. Thus the image had been modeled after God, but man after the image which had acquired the force of a pattern. So right there, I love his, his emphasis on logos and pattern because for me, that really highlights sort of my apologetic technique to non-believers and talking about the logos as fractal, sacred geometry, Fibonacci, phi, pi, all this stuff these patterns which are so popularly celebrated by the spiritual but not religious, pagans, all this stuff as God, um, that is the Logos. That is the Logos. Okay, <clears throat> this is in a section on knowledge and prophecy, and it's, and it's a theory of knowledge titled, The Human Mind is a Fragment of the Divine Logos. Every man, in respect of his mind, is intimately related to the divine logos, being an imprint or fragment or effluence 
of the blessed nature, but in the constitution of his body, he is related to the entire world. For he is a blend of the same things, earth, water, air, and fire, each of the elements having contributed the share that falls it, falls to it to complete an entirely sufficient material that the Creator had to take in order to fashion the visible image. All right. This is an entirely different section. This is titled, The Vision of the Logos. It is characteristic of those who serve the existent. Uh, he's using existent as a capitalized name of God. Uh, I think he's associating, a, and this is kind of the ontological argument, he's, a, he's equating God with being. It is characteristic of those who serve the existent that theirs are not the, the task of cupbearers or bakers or cooks or anything other earthly tasks, nor do they mold or construct material things like brickwork, but in their reasonings ascend to the ethereal height setting before them Moses, the genus beloved of God, to lead the way. For then they shall behold the place, which in reality is the Logos, where stands God the steadfast and unchanging, and also what lies under his feet like the work of a brick or of sapphire, like the form of the firmament of heaven, Exodus 24.10, namely the sensible world intimated through these words, for it is fitting for those who have entered into comradeship with knowledge to long to see the existent, but if they are unable to see it, at least his image, the truly holy Logos, and after the Logos, its most perfect work in the realm of the sensible, this world, for philosophy was never anything but the earnest desire to see things precisely as they are. This is titled, Meeting with the Logos, Sudden and Unexpected. It is extraordinarily apt that he, Abraham, does not say that he came to the place, but that he met with a place, Genesis 18.33. For coming is a matter of choice, but meeting is often without one's volition. And this is so in order that the divine Logos, manifesting itself suddenly as a fellow traveler to a desolate soul, might tender it an unexpected joy, greater than hope. For Moses, too, leads the people forth to meet God, Exodus 19.17, knowing full well that he comes invisibly to the souls that long to converse with him. I thought that was really interesting that... Uh... Um, that last line that for Moses too leads the people forth to meet God, knowing full well that he comes invisibly to the souls that long to converse with him. You could even throw a sort of uh, synchronistic uh, approach to that passage, meaning the invis in invisibility in which the Logos encounters the soul which strives for it. Sort of, you know, I think everybody that's kind of gone on this journey that uh, we talk about is uh, has witnessed the rise of synchronicities. At least for me, I would say, and I've gotten emails from people that getting back into this logos theology, rediscovering the the true meaning of Christianity, um, synchronicities start to arise in your life. Uh, not that they didn't before. Maybe you were a pagan. Maybe you're a new age or whatever. But, uh, I don't know, things just start to take on a new sort of significance and meaning. Here is another passage titled, Living According to Nature. And the wise man's actions are nothing but the words of God. We are told next that Abraham went forth as the Lord had spoken to him. Genesis 12.4 this is the end celebrated by the best philosophers, to live in agreement with nature, very stoic. And it is attained whenever the mind, having entered on the path of virtue, 
treads the track of right reason and follows God, mindful of his ordinances and always and everywhere confirming them all both by word and deed. Very stoic, that first passage. Very stoic. Four, he went forth as the Lord spoke to him. The meaning of this is that as God speaks, and he speaks in a manner most admirable and praiseworthy, so the man of virtue does everything, blamelessly making straight his life path, so that the actions of the sage differ in no way from the divine words. Elsewhere, in any case, he says, Abraham did all my law, Genesis 12, or Genesis 26, 5, law being evidently nothing else than the divine logos commanding what we ought to do and forbidding what we should not do. As Moses attests by saying, he received a law from his words, Deuteronomy 33, 3. If then the law is a divine logos and the man of virtue does the law, then surely he does the logos. So that, as I said, the divine logoi are the wise man's actions. Now we've talked about logos and logoi in terms of traditional orthodox understanding of logoi being, you know, truth, reason, logic, honor, glory, all these things. I love this last line then where he says, if then... The law is a divine logos, and the man of virtue does the law, then surely he does the logos. So that, as I said, the divine logoi are the wise man's actions. I love that. Okay, last passage here. Last passage. And this is called, Moses Cuts Away the desiderative and spirited elements. But some, exceeding all measure, have indulged not only what comes under the head of desire, but also its sister passion, vehement emotion, wishing to rekindle the entire irrational portion of the soul and thus destroy the mind For that which was said literally of the serpent is in reality a truly divine oracle that applies to every passion-loving man. On your breast and in your belly shall you go. Genesis 3.14 For vehement emotion is located in the breast and desire in the belly. The fool advances by means of both vehement emotion and desire without intermission after injecting mind, its charioteer and leader. So even in Stoicism, I mentioned how Logos is the rider of a horse. Uh, Unbeknownst to me, uh, Philo makes a similar analogy as Logos being the charioteer or leader, the mind, and that these people who are driven by vehement emotion and desire are putting mind second, and therefore they're going to always be led astray and led away from God because they're driven by emotion. The fool advances by means of both vehement emotion and desire without intermission after ejecting mind, its charioteer and leader. The man of opposite character has excised vehement emotion and desire and has signed up the divine logos as his pilot. Even as Moses, most beloved of God, who, when offering the whole burnt offerings of the soul, will wash out the belly, Leviticus 8.21, that is, will cleanse away every form of desire, but the breast from the ram of consecration he will, move, he will remove, Leviticus 8.2. The, this is undoubtedly signifies the warlike spirited element in its entirety, which is removed so that the better portion of the soul that is left, the rational element, may employ its truly free and noble-minded impulses toward all things beautiful, with nothing tugging at it any longer and diverting it. So, uh, that is, I'm sure I could have found more passages. Those were the main passages that I found in regards to Philo talking about Logos. This is the conclusion of my video. 
Let me know what you guys think. I'm sure this is a bit longer than you were expecting. I hope everybody enjoyed it. Let me know if you had criticisms, if you think I missed something. I always appreciate that. I did get the the, the foam for the microphone, so I hope the sound is a lot better in this video than the last video, the video for the 300 movie, the movie review. Um, so let me know what you guys think. Please like, share, and subscribe this video. Uh, share it with anybody you think would be interested in this information. Um, and that's basically all I have to say. Uh, please comment. You know, I love hearing what you guys think about these videos. So thank you very much for everything. Thank you for all the support. You can expect a lot more videos coming out now that I'm back and I can do my research, I can do my readings, and then <laughs> I can make the videos. So thank you guys for all the support. I truly appreciate it. I truly love you guys. And as always, God bless.